All right. Uh, good evening. Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, for the few who might not know, I'm Anthony Elms, Chief Curator here at the ICA. And tonight it's uh, great to welcome Daniela Rose King for her first official program, for her first official show here at the ICA. We couldn't be happier to have her, the show, and the programs. And just to uh, also say we're very, I'm very thankful through Daniela to have learned the, about the work of Keisha Scarville. And so looking forward to learning more from the source tonight. And for those of you around the theme of the show, look for later, later, later in the summer when we will have a, a talk in an event with Catherine McKintrick, who's an important sort of thinker for ideas that are spiraling through the show upstairs. And then I'm sure you'll hear that name probably sometime tonight. Um, because when, before we deal with the present, we always have to deal with the uh, future here and the support. We would for, I would first like to say that, uh, of course, as always, support for the programming is generously provided by the Spiegel-Wilkes Fund, and that support for this particular exhibition, the last place they thought of, and for uh, Daniela's position, uh, comes from the uh, Leonard and Judy Lauder Fund. And then to think more institutionally around other things, uh, make sure people are aware that Wednesday, May 16th, we will have a curators led tour of the Suki Suyun King show upstairs on the second floor that shares the space with Daniela's show. And then at Saturday, May 19th, we will have a queer gaming panel hosted by Naylan Blake with Nika Ross, Adriana Shaw, Colleen Macklin, and Robert Yang. But these are never all the things that happen at the ICA. There's other events that pop up here and there. So please, uh, if you don't get our emails, sign up for them. Or if you don't need emails, check the website early and often. And with that, Daniela and Keisha. Thank you, Anthony. Um, thank you all for being here. And thank you especially to Keisha. Um, I'm going to just do a, a brief sort of introduction to my exhibition, uh, Keisha's work and how we met. Um, and then Keisha's going to do quite an extensive sort of walkthrough of her, some important works in her practice, um, particularly Lee Wan's, and kind of um, ending up talking about the placelessness of echoes and kinship of shadows, which is the work that's currently on display in the last place they thought of. Um, and I might interject at points and we'll try and have a conversation. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, uh, when I started thinking about my like, early ideas for this exhibition, I was really thinking about geography and landscape um, uh, and where <coughs> black women fit into those two sort of spheres or disciplines. Um, in terms of like historical contributions um, and as well as thinking about the art historical canon. Um, I was thinking really broadly about this and talking to a friend of mine, uh, Julia Phillips, who's a wonderful artist, and she said that I had to look at Keisha's work. Um, Keisha and Julia had met at Skowhegan, right, in 2016. And um, so she introduced us and we very quickly did a studio visit. Um, and it was really wonderful because one of the, th the things that we kind of connected over um, and sort of, um, I don't know, one of the things that I just really remember from that studio visit was we were both talking about uh, two different Caribbean authors. I was talking about how I was reading um, a text called, a novel called I Tichaba, Black Witch of Salem by um, Maurice Condé, who's a Martinican uh, writer. And Keisha was reading, or was thinking through, um, Wilson Harris's Palace of the Peacock. Wilson Harris is a Guyanese British writer. Um, and it's really exciting to think that we had this conversation in like October, and now in May we're returning to it. And that's gonna be kind of the, the kind of meat of this conversation in some ways. Um, but yeah, so, um, that also makes me think about a term that I recently learned, which is, oh, excuse me, diaspora literacy. 
which is a term coined by um, uh, an, an, a writer and a scholar, Veve Clark. Um, and it's a kind of way of describing all of the um, <coughs> histories and narratives and art, visual literature and otherwise that's produced within the black diaspora and produced particularly within um, sort of um, spaces that are connected to the transatlantic slave trade. Um, and that's certainly a, um, a lens with which I'm, I'm kind of thinking about the exhibition that's upstairs too. Um, and it's just this kind of capacity um, for um, narrators and readers to be able to kind of um, absorb all of these different references and stories, whether it comes from sort of um, African-American liter literary traditions and art, or from the Caribbean, or from black British kind of cultural production. You know, there's a way of understanding and there's a way of this kind of interconnected interwovenness, which is really, incredibly rich and diverse um, and speaks a little bit to um, my own position as a, a Caribbean British um, curator who's now living in America. Um, and it's, um, I think it's also a way that we found we were kind of communicating in an early way in our studio visit, um, that these were some of the things we had in common. Um, so um, with that in mind, um, the exhibition upstairs is called The Last Place They Thought Of, and that is um, taken from um, Harriet Jacobs' uh, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, which is her slave narrative which she wrote in the 19th century, early 19th century, which describes her escape from slavery, and particularly her um, hiding in uh, her grandmother's garret, which is the space above her attic, where she hid for seven years, and she hid in the last place they thought of. Her grandmother was still a slave at the time, um, and it was on the, say, the plantation where her owner was, you know, actively looking, searching for her. And for me, this became um, a way of thinking about, um, I mean, in, in that book and, and people that have written about it since talk about the um, paradoxical nature of space, particularly as it applies to black bodies within the black diaspora, which is this duality of um, confinement and uh, concealment and protection, um, uh, captivity, but also as a means of um, emancipation and freedom. So I was thinking about space and how it has this potential um, and uh, a, a line that hits me is um, one of Catherine McKittrick's, who um, we are very lucky to have coming to visit us here in Philadelphia in August. But she talks about how um, uh, black matter, uh, blackness is a spatially defined matter. So black matters are spatial matters, I think is how she terms it. Um, and to think about um, those spaces as not just being um, the hold of the ship or the hold of the slave ship or a prison cell or a garret, but also um, ar broader architectures and geographies, thinking about uh, geographies in terms of the Caribbean. Um, this is a conversation we've had before and this is something you're gonna expand on, but this idea of the Caribbean as an idea and as an actual place, and as a place that is dislocated and disjointed and doesn't make sense as a geography, and, it, um, but, but, and yet there's still a sense of community there. Um, so um, for me, the exhibition, the four artists in the exhibition, including Keisha Scarville, we have Lorraine O'Grady, Torquasse Dyson, and Jade Montserrat, they're all in different ways kind of unpacking this idea of space and geography and how um, a black feminist approach or subjecti subjectivity can kind of trouble that or critique it or pull it apart or renew it or help us think about how um, sort of arbitrarily or um, how those decisions were made in the colonial era and we need to continue to kind of um, interrogate them. So, um, I'm really excited tonight to have Keisha Scarville here to help think through all of like, what's at stake in this exhibition and also to help kind of unpack some of these ideas through your work. Um, we're really, really lucky to have you here and I'm really excited to see your images and 
also you very kindly sharing with us some clips of work which hasn't been, which is still in progress as well so we're very very privileged to have you here with us um, and yeah with that I will turn it over to you thank you um, and you know and thank you as well Danielle for putting together the show and and just recognizing um, <clears throat> and championing um, this effort to have an intergenerational voice to how black women are thinking about geography. So I want to thank you and I want to thank ICA and I always have a lot of laughs when I'm here. So <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, so, oh, is this the clicker? Um, so I wanted to start with um, this image. <clears throat> And I'm going to be sharing a couple of images, or images from a couple of series tonight um, to kind of lead up to the work that's, that I'm currently thinking about, which is in the show, Placelessness of Echoes. And this is a photograph of my parents. And this was taken in January, January about 1969. Um, my mom was pregnant with my brother, who would show up in March 1969. Um, <clears throat> And I wanted to start with this image because it really, for me, all starts with this image. And, and, you know, I often think about archive, of course, as a place to return to, but also how it speaks to these kind of future identities. Um, but also the latency, you know, the, the, the archive, the image, and the latent image um, within the image, and, and, and how that latency kind of revealed itself in certain conditions. Um, but just to kind of give a backdrop of kind of the place or the landscape in which I grew up in. Um, my parents, uh, my dad moved to America in 1967. My mom came about a year later. And um, they came at a time when um, Guyana just uh, gained independence from Britain, I believe in 1966. And during that time, there was just kind of a mass exodus. Everybody was moving out of um, Guyana, um, either to New York, Canada, or to England. And so my parents came here, you know, both, you know, both with the same idea, you know, kind of invested in, in this idea of the American dream and, and what that meant for them. Um, and what that meant for us as their offspring. Um, but my dad and my mom, you know, I look at this image and every single time I look at this image, I see something different. Um, you know, when I was younger, it was just a beautiful image and now when I look at it, there's so much more being revealed in it. And, <clears throat> you know, my dad and my mom, the, we were not allowed to watch television at all. Um, we were not al allowed to eat food outside. Everything we ate had to come from something that was cooked or baked inside. Um, music was played constantly. And the music that was, that was being played and, and the images that were in the home, um, we had this, there was this huge, in my, in my living room, there was a huge image of Marcus Garvey. And I remember growing up thinking that he was part of our family. I really did. I was like, is he our uncle? Because I was like, is that an uncle? And I was actually having this conversation with another friend of mine from the Caribbean, and she was saying the same thing. She's like, I thought he was my uncle too. Um, but, you know, his presence, you know, I would wake up and be greeted by this image of, of Marcus Garvey and my, and, and my parents were very strong black nationalists, um, pan-Africanists. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, this idea of, of what it meant to be, um, what it meant to be black, what it meant to be connected to Africa, um, was something that was instilled in me even before, and I would, and I have to be honest, before I really even understood what it meant, um, it was constantly being fed to me. And in terms of the music, you know, the music that was being played, um, you know, the early 1970s, <clears throat> um, the music that was coming out of the Caribbean, you know, roots reggae, 
Um, it was music that was speaking about, um, you know, these voices that were kind of speaking about the Caribbean in a way that was revolutionary, in a way that was thinking about the landscape, but also this kind of revolution, kind of this, this, this systematic decolonization of the mind. Um, <clears throat> So my dad would like sit me down. He would buy. He would bring a record home and he would play the whole album. And he would sit me down with the lyrics, and he would tell me, he's like, you know, read these lyrics and what did what does this mean to you? And so I was in this. You know, I was seven years old and I was like listening to Linton Kwesi Johnson, Street Sixty Six, and I'm like reading these lyrics and I'm, like what's going on in this? Um, or Peter Tosh, I am that I am, um, Police and Thieves. And I remember, I loved, <laughs> I remember I loved this song before I even understood what they were talking about, what Junior Marvin was talking about. And that was kind of a constant practice, Toots and the Maytels, Black Rose. Um, I remember um, having a long conversation, a seven-year-old girl having a long conversation about um, three o'clock roadblock with my dad. And, <clears throat> And just trying to understand, um, you know, what um, what it meant to to speak back to these institutions of power in the Caribbean, um, <clears throat> and how music was being used as a device, but also the word, the language. Um, so language and how language was being used in in a way that was kind of speaking back was something that. Um, that was instilled in me at a very young age. Um, <clears throat> and I remember, you know, I would want to watch television so bad, and my dad would, you know, he's like, okay, he's like, you, and my mom, they would say, you know, you can read a book. You, you have two choices, you can read a book or you could go outside and play. And I'm like, okay. So I would read, and if I didn't have anything to read, they would give me the newspaper. And and I was like, and I'm like, I don't really want to, I just want to read the comics, but I couldn't read the comics. And, you know, they would sit me down, they're like, you know, read something and, you know, and tell us what you read. And I, I'm like, I don't even know what this means. And I had such a hard time with the word indictment. <laughs> and I remember reading it and I was like, indictment? And I was like, somebody got indicted. And, and my dad was like, you mean somebody got indicted? And I was like, that's not what that says. But, but did but that mean something to you as a seven-year-old? Indictment or, or well, indictment? No, indictment. <laughs> um, I think over time, like I kept seeing the word. Every single time I'd read the newspaper, I'm like, somebody else, like what is going on? Why is everybody getting indicted? <laughs> but, um, you know, at the time, and I remember my dad like explaining to me and, and so, you know, becoming aware of this court system. <laughs> Um, and becoming aware of this, you know, this legal landscape and indicted, like from a very early age, like this word indicted had, had so much weight to me. Um, so all of these things, and, and you know, not to um, go too, too deep, into, but just, just to kind of explain, um, you know, what um, was happening at this time. My parents came um, <clears throat> there was like a whole group of them that came and they all knew each other from Guyana and they came and they, you know, constantly, they, they were the people that I saw every day. And my dad was friends with a lot of Rastafarians, a lot of artists, and they would come and just kind of just hang out at the apartment. And um, my dad knew a lot of artists and he would just let them paint on our walls. And they would like paint murals on our walls. and. I would just kind of hang out, like, this is amazing, Rastafarians are, you know. <laughs> but I remember, again, I remember just the connection, everything was kind of being connected to this, this idea of, of using language, using art um, as a way to kind of talk about the, not only the physical landscape, but also thinking about the social landscape, thinking about the legal landscape. and. Um, and it was just instilled in me from a young age. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so a couple of things that just kind of inform the way I think about my projects um, and just thinking about the archive and thinking about migration and immigration and um, this kind of ripple effect 
uh, in terms of the stories that are formed in these ripples. And the thing that I keep coming back to, especially as photographer, is the position of the observer. And thinking about um, um, <clears throat> this idea of movement, and I think about that movement from Guyana to here, and growing up, my parents um, periodically would send me back to Guyana. I spent a lot of summers there um, growing up. So there was this constant flow of going back and forth and back and forth and thinking about um, that position of the observer. And, um, you know, I read about, like I was reading, you know, the way physics describes motion and um, a lot of it is about, you know, this position being transplanted and this, this subject moving, and not only is the subject moving from one place to another, but how is the subject being affected? How, not only does the position change, but the subject changes as well. And in order to kind of understand how that movement is taking place, you need this observational reference. You need someone or something to kind of observe um, this movement. Um, so as a first generation um, Guyanese American, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm, all, I'm often kind of thinking about, you know, my position as an observer to my parents' migration or immigration um, experience, but also my own um, experiences, kind of this first generation, kind of going back and forth, and um, from a, again, from a very early age, you know, I would go to Guyana and they would make fun of my accent, you know, because I didn't have the Caribbean accent. Um, and being here in America growing up, I would watch kids get made fun of for having an accent. Um, you know, Haitians got it the worst, which was fascinating to me, um, you know, just how those stereotypes and that, that thought process. But, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of people from the Caribbean, that, that experience of them, you know, growing up in school and kind of seeing what that experience was like and not necessarily fully identifying or fully being accepted as a Guyanese, but, not, but also not really fully identifying um, with being an American and trying to understand that. <clears throat> um, you know, I remember telling my dad, I'm like, I was like, why don't we have McDonald's? for breakfast, and he was like, what are you talking about? Um, He's like, here's some steamed fish, and you know, eat, eat it. Um, so, you know, as a photographer, as an image maker, um, but also as a first generational um, um, person um, and woman, you know, just kind of understanding that position as, of being the observer and, and being that observational reference to kind of identify and, and watching these shifts, but also, you know, how it's internalized as well. So a, a natural kind of documentarian then, or photographer potentially? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, would say, I would say so. I mean, I think, you know, I, I'm, I am fascinated about the, the, the camera's presence um, and, and how the camera is kind of responding and, and how it's being used as a tool to develop these ideas and, or, or how the camera makes sense of these narratives and, and how all of that gets translated into this photographic language, you know. Um, <clears throat> so photography became something that just kind of occurred. Um, my, you know, again, my parents, my family members, my, my family's friends, um, documenting and photographing every single minute of this American experience was very important. And so it just became a tool that I think I naturally attached to, you know. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so the way in which I'm kind of thinking about photography and thinking about the images that I'm making, you know, a lot of my work kind of focuses on objects and, and and kind of uncovering these histories or distilling these, these ideas within the object and kind of thinking about it in a different way. Um, you know, this is a photograph of a mirror. Um, <clears throat> but also, you know, a lot of my work involves thinking about, um, you know, my place within the landscape and how I connect to the environment or how the environment kind of shapes um, my experience. Um, so, Oh, can you pause this? Do you mind pausing this? 
Okay. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Um, so this is an early video I made. Um, so this is just some early thoughts or early kind of working through relationship to landscape and but also thinking about um, you know that I, that idea of becoming part of um, so this is kind of like an early iteration where I was kind of thinking through that um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to show a couple of images a couple of early images and then um, share a couple of um, series um, so um, when I started to kind of take up photography seriously, um, and these images were taken shortly after undergrad, actually I finished undergrad in Rochester, um, and when I went back to Guyana, and part of me wanted to take this time to start to really understand um, the landscape of Guyana, um, and understand the, like what Guyana meant to me, and you know, really, pushing against, a lot of it was really kind of pushing against, you know, how the Caribbean um, lived in the imagination. <clears throat> um, not necessarily as this place of paradise, but also thinking, but, but really thinking about it um, as a place where these kind of stories unfolded, these multi-layered stories unfolded. And so I was photographing in and around my grandfather's house um, in Buxton, Guyana and doing a lot of research at the time, um, found out that Buxton, the village of Buxton, um, used to be a plantation. And once it no, was no longer viable for the Portuguese to have these plantations, they were selling the property off. And a lot of um, <clears throat> ex-slaves, a lot of ex-African Af or Afro-Guyanese um, would pull together, they would form these cooperatives. They would pull together, save their money, and they actually pulled together, save their money, and bought the property of Buxton and made it their own. Um, they named it Buxton. The space, the, the land was called Buxton. They named it after um, a member of the parliament who was a champion for the ab abolition of slavery. Um, so this is my grandfather's house, um, which has been in the family forever. Um, so, you know, over the years I've returned back to, to um, Guyana and, and just really creating these images. And a lot of the images are, are photographing my family. The majority of my family is still there. But a lot of what I'm trying to really do is really understand the landscape and, and understand um, <clears throat> the architecture, the geography. And, and you know, you see these, especially in the geography, you kind of see these remnants of the, this kind of colonialist um, or colonialist um, um, aesthetic. Um, <clears throat> All the, the kind of ruins of the colonial architecture mm, as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and also you see these, these you know, there's, there are these unfinished um, cement houses, um, you know, building your own, ha you know, having your own property and building um, your own house is something that's extremely important. Um, and I've actually been talking to my cousin who's building her house right now and just, you know, wood has become no longer viable as a material to use, so everyone is using cement. Um, so you kind of see these different cement houses in different stages. And, you know, there's something really fascinating to me about that in terms of 
um, these different stages of kind of creating a space of your own um, <clears throat> or creating a space of your own. And some, some homes, unfortunately, are in this stage for a long period of time um, because they're waiting to kind of get more money to, um, to finish it. <clears throat> um, so the first series I wanted to show, just kind of teasing out some of these ideas, um, is a series um, titled I Am Here. Um, and just kind of thinking about this, this idea of hereness, at the time I was really thinking about um, this idea of hereness and what that means um, to claim a space and to actually take up space and, and, and to in, in construct that space and to make it one's own. And the, the natural place I kind of went to is, you know, how does one create or claim space or, or start to kind of think about um, who they are within the world? And the natural place I went to was the home. Um, so the images are kind of these contemplations about how one starts to create a sense of home. And I was kind of reflecting on my own um, experiences. Um, and the aesthetic that I was kind of thinking about, aesthetically I was just really thinking about this kind of distillation um, and just kind of this, just breaking down to these kind of very, very particular moments or ideas of what it means to kind of create a space of belonging. Um, <clears throat> and in the series, I kind of interject these different um, words that I connect to, um, you know, these rituals and, and um, these happenings or memories that kind of become the ways in which the home is built or the space of belonging is built. And I included this um, Black Fist Digging Roots um, because in addition to Marcus Garvey, there were, you know, there were these Black Power Fists that were kind of littered um, th or placed throughout um, my apartment um, growing up, <clears throat> um, but also, you know, you know, my mom was always, you know, working on her plants and doing pottery, and so just kind of wanting to kind of play with language in that way. And I think about language, and I was thinking about ways in which the language or language can be used to to activate or kind of speak to the corners and the and the cracks and the breaks, um, <clears throat> and those things that can't necessarily be visualized. Um, so again, you know, I was thinking with this image, in, you know, there were pictures everywhere and instead of kind of, you know, setting up photographs, I just wanted to really kind of dissect and, and distill, again, um, this kind of essence of like what the, the, the picture actually is, is this glass against um, framing um, a particular moment. So I wanted to just think about the glass itself and what is lying behind it or the, um, the constant burning of incense in the home as a way of kind of smoking out. Um, <clears throat> um, my mom would keep a, a Bible underneath her, her pillow and so I wanted to use that as an image. Um, so in this image, <clears throat> as part of this series, um, I created this image where I'm kind of setting up and these bones, and there was a dish that my mom would make, um, and afterwards, when she was done, she would save the bones and she would bleach them and dry them out. <clears throat> and she would save them and she would decorate them and give, it, give one to me, and became, over time, it became this kind of exchange where, um, you know, she would give me, she would decorate some and give, give some to me, I would decorate some, give them to her. And, you know, it was kind of this early idea of kind of thinking about um, repurposing, um, but also kind of taking this thing and, and, and it becoming treasure. Um, so I wanted to create an image where using those bones within the image Uh, 
Um, <clears throat> um, so, the, so the Mama's Clothes series, <clears throat> um, I was doing a residency in 2015, I was doing a residency in Syracuse uh, Light Work. And, and you, you know, I was there for about a month kind of thinking about, um, I was still thinking about the I Am Here series, and I asked my mom if she would come up to um, Syracuse so I could photograph her. Um, and at the time I was um, interviewing both of my parents, um, you know, and I think around that time it was coming up on a, their 50 year anniversary um, being here in America, so I wanted to interview them. Um, and ask them questions about how they felt about being here and, and ask them questions about the American landscape. And so this was part of um, some images that I took of her <clears throat> and using the bones again to kind of mark her space. And the image, this image was taken on August 13th, 2014. And about two, I think it was about, she wasn't feeling, she wasn't feeling well that day, and um, two days later she went back to Syracuse, excuse me, went back to New York and um, she received her diagnosis that, she went to the doctor and she received a diagnosis that she had cancer. And a year to the day, so this was taken on August 13th, uh, 2014, um, a year to the day um, she passed away. And, you know, at the time I, I was, you know, when we first got the diagnosis, I started doing a lot of research and it was, you know, it was alarming in terms of um, the number, you know, the number of people that were being diagnosed with cancer, um, <clears throat> but also the number of deaths from cancer. Um, you know, black Americans um, by far um, have the highest um, date, uh, uh, rate of mortality um, from cancer. And, you know, it just was something that was just mind boggling to me. <clears throat> um, so at the time, you know, once she passed, when she passed away, I wanted to create a, a body of work um, that memorialized her. And at the time, I was really interested in how the photograph, um, you, you know, how do you photograph someone who's no longer there? Um, and, and wanting to kind of engage in this kind of aesthetics of invisibility and, and, you know, at the same time kind of dealing with, you know, what do you do with the remnants of someone's presence? And <clears throat> I was doing a lot of research at the time, I was doing a lot of research into spirit photography. And this idea of ectoplasm <clears throat> and spirit photography, you know, was something that was, you know, in its heyday was in 1860s, 1870s, you know, you know in the infancy of, of the photographic medium. And, <clears throat> you know, people were seeing these double images and thinking that, you know, this was a spirit. And, there were mediums that would, you know, as they were kind of channeling this spirit, um, this material, material, be, material would be excreted from their body. And they, call it, they referred to it as ectoplasm. And I was just really fascinated um, by this idea of um, the material or this kind of exteriorizing, or this exteriorizing of um, this presence. <clears throat> and, it became really fascinating to me, um, the way in which it was being represented. Um, I was also doing a lot of research into other, how other cultures were kind of thinking about ancestral spirits um, and doing research into the Agoon or the Agungun, um, which you see often within a lot of West African um, traditional practices, um, where the person, <clears throat> the person who was um, deemed an, um, a carrier of this spirit, um, they would create this costume where you know you you did not see any, you can't see any um, flesh or or any kind of signification of their body, and <clears throat> that was really interesting to me in terms of how the body became this portal and in, in which you start to see this, or, or start to celebrate or, or have a, a, a connection with um, this figure that is no longer there. 
um, but also how um, you know, the ancestor kind of can come back and be celebrated or, or be within this realm. Um, so to that end, I started to create images um, using my mom's clothes. <clears throat> and in the early in beginning of the project, I was kind of using it as kind of a way to obscure the face um, and kind of doing these kind of different performances. <clears throat> And, and also trying to kind of think about recreating and, and thinking about ways in which um, the presence can be conjured and how my body could be used as a medium. And I knew at the time that I wanted to go back to Guyana and, and work on this project. So I decided to, I literally packed it, you know, practically a trunk full of her clothes, packed it up and, and went back to Guyana. And I went back to my grandfather's house and worked on this project um, in and around that space. And I was thinking a lot about the body as a vessel Um, and also ways in which the, the landscape could be a backdrop for, for speaking to her presence. Um, where my grandfather's house is, um, it lies along um, what's called the seawall. Um, Guyana is slightly below um, sea level, so this seawall is, you know, it's a place that, it's, it's the structure that kind of protects um, Buxton from, or, or this kind of coastline from flooding. But it's also a place where people go to hang out and, and enjoy each other and, and have fun. And um, this was part of a series of images and that I was trying to make into a video where I kind of lined her clothes along the seawall. Um, and as I was developing uh, the project, um, I started to embrace black and white and, and thinking, and, you know, just as the kind of natural trajectory of the, of the project, kind of thinking about the ways um, in which the two-dimensionality of the image, you know, starting to kind of break up this idea of, of, of depth in the image, that things started to kind of blur into each other. Um, and, you know, how through that black and white, that grayscale and the pattern, um, things started to blend into the landscape as well. Um, so in all the images, I'm, I'm using her fabric, um, her clothes um, to create the images. And, you know, creating these, these portraits um, using just her clothing. And I've been really thinking, you know, with this project, I've been really thinking a lot about um, the materiality of absence and, um, you know, wanting to kind of fill the frame up with as much fabric as possible. And I was reading an essay at the time by John Berg Berger where he was kind of talking about absence being this ambush of space. And I love that idea, that, that, that paradox of, of the fullness of absence. Um, and just wanting to, you know, have the images feel like bulges and folds and kind of wanting to resuscitate or, or reconstruct or, or reimagine a space, um, you know, to take something that's invisible and, and reconstruct it.
It's all right. Hmm? <clears throat> um, so the other project um, I wanted to share, so it was, you know, it's, a, it's an ongoing project, um, is uh, Passports. Uh, <clears throat> and this was started from a conversation I was having with my dad about, um, you know, it was part of these interviews I was doing of my parents, and he said something really interesting to me when we were talking. He's like, I no longer, he's like, I, I identify as American. And he's like, I don't necessarily identify as Guyanese as much anymore. And, and it, it just struck me, and I was like, really? He's like, yeah, he's like, I, I, I'm American. And I was very curious about that in terms of how, how, you know, how do you no longer see your connection to the place of, of your birth and start to take on this different identity? And <clears throat> um, that process became really fascinating to me um, of, you know, of, of not necessarily shifting identity, but the ways in which your identity becomes shifted by, by movement of place. And so I wanted to take, um, do a project that kind of spoke to that. And this is my um, dad's first passport photo when he was 16 years old. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, the idea of the passport as a kind of a signifier, um, the, the passport kind of being this um, representation of subjecthood, um, but also the aesthetics of the passport, how the, you know, how we're told that we, the passport, what we can include in the passport, um, how we present ourselves in the passport photo, all of that became really fascinating to me. And, but also, you know, this kind of shape shifting, I would say, of, of one's identity from, from being um, of one place and becoming and claiming um, the identity of another. Um, so in the, in the series, I, you know, I reconstruct or, or, or reimagine his passport photo in different ways. And um, the different actions are kind of informed by stories that he, he and I would, sh he and I have had, or he would share with me in conversations he and I had. Um, <clears throat> in some cases, I'm using whiteout. Um, in some cases, kind of using the passport photo as a platform, um, as a tableau, to kind of speak to um, the history of, of the African within the Caribbean, but also the African within America. Um, <clears throat> in this one, I was, um, when I was doing research for the project, um, I found this article that was published in Guyana um, shortly after um, it, it gained independence. And the article was basically saying that after Guyana achieved independence, that everyone's citizenship was, being, was starting to become questioned. And people who had lived there for like 40 years um, was no, were no longer being deemed Guyanese or having that Guyanese citizenship. Um, <clears throat> so in the article I was reading and you know, they were interviewing someone and they were saying that, well, you know, we're no longer sure if that person is one of we. <laughs> and in parentheses, they put one of us. <laughs> and, I, and I was just fascinated, again, I was really fascinated again by, the, by language, um, um, the colloquialism, <laughs> but also how it needs to be, needs to be translated, you know? Um, but also, um, you know... Like there's the symmetry of it as well. Yeah. Like it's kind of mm. trans, yeah. Um, you know, with, with my parents' um, experience coming here and, you know, their accents not being... Pe people can't really kind of understand their accent. And I'm always fascinated, like, when I see, 
like clips of like people people of Caribbean heritage or people with the Car the Caribbean accent yeah, speaking, and they have to it, sub they, yeah. they have the subtitles, and I'm really it's just really interesting in terms of that that form of, of translation and and what that means and 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 what's being translated. Um, <clears throat> Um, so I wanted to create something um, that spoke to that. Um, and and all, also within the series, there's, there is this kind of meshing of my identity with my dad's identity. Um, <clears throat> and this image in particular, um, I asked my dad, I remember asking my dad and my mom, like, why America? Like, why New York? And I remember my dad, he was like, well, you know, he was like, it was the movies. <laughs> He was a huge Sidney Poitier fan, but they both were. And, um, you know, even like what Sidney Poitier meant as a, as, a, as a symbol or as this person. But I found this um, puzzle of all these different characters that Sidney Poitier has played throughout um, his career. And I found this puzzle piece of Sidney Poitier's face and placed it over my dad's. It's interesting you said um, the movies, because my dad always, I don't know if he's serious, but he always said it was the football that got him to football. the UK, yeah, the soccer. <laughs> so. huh. But I also think it's really interesting how you, talk, you describe this as um, shape-shifting, that mm. transformation of identity. And it just really makes me think of Stuart Hall and how you know, he talks about how identity and subjectivity is, is, uh, is not fixed, you know? Mm. Like what we're born, what we become, all of these migrations and movements mm. and all of these transformations, you know, they, they, they change our identity as well and our mm. subjectivity and our sort of um, our positions for sure. Well, it's interesting because I, you know, I was talking to my dad and he said to me, he's like, you're more Guyanese than I am now. And so it's, we've kind of, we're, we're kind of like, occupying like I've, I think I've been back to Guyana more than my dad has at this point so it's kind of we're kind of occupying these kind of like swapping. yeah slightly um, you know and I wanted to include this image as well from the 1968 uh, Mexico City Olympics um, <clears throat> Tommy Smith and um, John Carlos and you know it, I was thinking about with again with the project I was thinking about um, you know with these migration stories um, and these, you know, these, these, these movements, um, you know, there's the histories that we carry with us, the histories that you carry with, with us, and also the histories that you're embedded in, you know, and, and thinking about, um, you know, my dad and my mom as, as Caribbean, but also as, as a black woman and as, as a black man in America in the 1960s. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, the, the politics, the politics of where you come from, but also the politics and the, how you carry those politics, but the politics and, and social um, landscape that you're, you then um, arrive in, um, but and also have to absorb too. Mm -hmm. Yes. I don't really want to time. Okay, gotcha. Okay. <clears throat> um, so I wanted to, oops, I wanted to, you know, use a couple of images to kind of speak back to the, um, the Black Nationalist Flag um, and Marcus Garvey. And so I did a few were just using that, that color scheme and, and employing the black star um, into the image. Um, and this, this is just an image of how the images are displayed. Um, the size of the images are about the size of a passport photo or slightly smaller, excuse me, slightly larger. Um, and I put them into these archival sleeves. Um, and part of it was to kind of, 
thinking about the display kind of break apart or kind of break away from thinking of it as a, you know, in an art piece, but also kind of thinking about the way in which the sleeve evokes uh, an idea of, of evidence and becomes a constellation of evidence. Okay. <laughs> We're here. Um, so, sorry, give me a second. Um, so, um, <clears throat> The current work that I'm, I'm doing, and I'm still working on the other projects, but the current work that I'm doing is um, uh, placelessness of echoes and kinship of shadows. And, and this was um, begun in 2016 while at Skowhegan. Um, and in Skowhegan, you are in the woods for a good chunk of time. And there's a lot you can do, <laughs> but there were certain, you know, there were things that, you, there's a lot you can do, but I don't know, most of the things I wasn't really interested in, and I just, I, I found myself in this space um, <clears throat> um, and, and trying to kind of navigate this, you were kind of embedded in the woods and trying to kind of navigate this space. And <clears throat> one of the things that came up um, was moving around in the dark. And that was a very unsettling experience. And in, if you did not have a flashlight, um, basically there was no way. You just really had to kind of use your senses to navigate back to your studio or to um, um, your room. And so in this space, I wanted to do a project um, that kind of spoke to that experience of kind of being this space. and and not necessarily having any kind of visual cues to tell you where you are. And I was, in order to kind of deal with that experience, um, <clears throat> I was doing some research and, and I found this song um, um, by um, Blind Willie Johnson, Dark Was the Night, Cold Was the Ground. And Which I would- was this song that was playing as you, as you came in yeah. as well? And I would, I would listen to the song at night, you know, as, as I was walking home, I would listen to that song um, just kind of over and over again and it just resonated with me so strongly. There was something about that, it almost felt like a hymn. And, <clears throat> you know, I found out about, you know, I found out that it was one of the songs that was included in the um, Voyager record um, that's basically, I think it's an interstellar. It's been out there for like 44 years or something now. Um, and there was something really fascinating to me about, um, you know, this song, um, you know, just kind of that, that, that beat, that, that sound, kind of traveling through um, this kind of unknown space. And it became this very grounding um, element for me. Um, <clears throat> so I was, I was listening to that song a lot um, during that time. And, and, and reading a lot. I was, in, at the time I was reading Wild Seed um, by um, Octavia Butler. And I was talking to a friend of mine and she asked me if I knew um, Wilson Harris. I was talking to a friend, another artist that was there, Deborah Anziger, who is from Jamaica. And she asked me if I had ever read Wilson Harris. And I had never heard of Wilson Harris. And um, she, told, you know, she was like, he's a Guyanese writer. She's like, how can you not? And I, I, again, you know, she and I talked about him. And I got a copy of um, his book, Palace of the Peacock. She described the book to me. And I got the book, and I was just completely floored um, by his language. And just in terms of. Um, how he troubles language, his, his use of narrative, um, but also the ways in which he talked about the landscape. It just completely spoke to me. Um, <clears throat> so wanting to develop a, a project, and Wilson Harris, who started off as a surveyor, he was a surveyor in Guyana, and in about, I think, 1959, he moved from Guyana to England and he published Palace of the Peacock in 1960. And he wrote, and he wrote, and he written um, lots of poetry and, and essays 
about the landscape and how we think about landscape and, and not in a way of like, you know, how do you become one with nature? And, you know, there was something about it that started, that allowed for us to kind of tease out a voice that the landscape had, um, but also our relationship and um, how we think about, um, it, it was a way in which I felt like kind of decentered um, everything kind of being human, starting from human. There was something I feel like very Silvio Winter-ish, um, but in a very different language about how he was thinking about landscape that just really stuck with me. Um, <clears throat> so I began this project um, and I started off um, thinking about creating these images um, about um, kind of navigating this unknown space. And a lot of the early images were taken during the day. And part of it was that there was just too much anxiety about doing it at night. Um, <clears throat> and in Palace of the Peacock, um, the book, um, the book basically is about um, this group of, of men that go on this journey together. And everyone in the book um, represents, excuse me, everyone in the crew represents a different demographic of Guyana. So there's uh, Portuguese, um, Amerindian, there's um, um, African, and they go on this journey into the interior, what we call the interior and landscape, or we call it the bush, really. Um, and they're basically seeking, um, they're seeking an, an individual, but they're also seeking um, labor. And as they travel deep into the interior, you know, each of them kind of, each of them meet their demise in a different way. And it becomes revealed to us that this is not their first time, that they are actually, they're kind of ghosts going into this space. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, you, as, we're, as you read the book, each individual slowly becomes transformed into something else. They become something else. They become part of the landscape. Um, and I was really fascinated by that idea. So in the series, what I, I wanted to do was really think about um, you know, how does one navigate these spaces of unknowing? but also how does the landscape become foregrounded in a way that it becomes a metaphor um, for transformation and the psyche and, and thinking about um, metaphysical bodies. And <clears throat> so I was reading Palace of the Peacock and I was reading his, um, a lot of his essays at the time and, and how he speaks about um, um, in this particular quote, which kind of triggered the direction that I wanted to take, um, where, he re where he speaks about the wood um, being hit by light and shadow and that transformation um, and that it activates it in a specific way, that it becomes something else. It becomes something, you know, deeper. Um, so <clears throat> in the, sorry, I'm just gonna push ahead. Um, so in the series, um, what I would do is I would um, go on these different hikes to these different locations <clears throat> and return back at night and, and, some time, and I would just be there out photographing at night and sometimes all night, sometimes I would just um, set up a tent and be there over a period of days. And so with, photo, with doing this project, uh, what I was really interested in was um, you know, thinking about how can I, as a woman, um, as a black woman, um, navigate these spaces um, um, as a way to think about um, power and as a way to kind of think about um, the landscape and geography as a place and claim it as a place of power. And, <clears throat> and I use Palace of the Peacock and I use Wilson Harris's writing um, to kind of think through the approach. Um, and as I was developing the project, um, one thing that came up for me was kind of using this, um, this idea of the shapeshifter, um, an individual, that, this woman that becomes part of the landscape at night, this nocturnal shapeshifter. And 
you know, that was really kind of a way to figure out how, how, hmm, hmm, this is the right word to say this. Um, you know, this again, this idea of becoming and, and what that looks like. <clears throat> and not only, you know, how does one physically and psychologically navigate um, these spaces. Um, so initially I was just going out there and photographing. In some cases I was actually speaking to the landscape and kind of waiting to see what would be revealed. How many images are in this series then so far? Um, I'm not quite sure. I think I know there's there's about 30 okay. in this the series altogether. And all of these images were taken in the northeast of the U.S. That's correct. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so wanting to kind of wanting to think about the ways in which the body, you know, there's something that happens at night where. Um, Spatially, things start to blur, um, sound, everything starts to kind of, everything starts to shift. And wanting to create images that kind of speak to um, these rifts. And the project really is um, a way to recreate or, or reconnect to the language of the landscape. And and thinking about darkness as a way to activate the image um, and it not being a space where, of, of absence, but kind of this, this active way of perception and, and a richness of perception. Can I ask you a bit about sure. the shapeshifter? Yeah. So um, after reading Palace of the Peacock and also reading uh, Jamaica Kincaid's In the Night, mm. uh, which you suggested as a, another sort of reference that's at work within this, this body of work at least, um, if not others, it, there was you know, similar kind of um, uh, metaphors for the shapeshifter kind of reveal themselves, like um, the uh, Jablesse or Jablesse in uh, Kincaid's writing, which is this like one hoof. Uh, a beautiful woman with a hoof for one foot and a, a regular foot for the other one, and she's kind of, you know, a sort of um, a mythical creature that lives in the, in the landscape. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have Mariella um, and different types of shapeshifters, including the crew in Palace of the Peacock. Mm -hmm. and I couldn't help but think of, like, sirens and other kind of, mm. you know, dangerous and beautiful female kind of figures within literature mm. across, like, over the ages. And it's, you know, this kind of warning to often men on a ship, but it can be, to, <laughs> you know, other kind of explorers and adventurers, you know, like kind of um, sort of a, a, a symbolization of, of the danger and beauty of nature and of, like, the unknowability, unknow unknowingness of the landscape, potentially. Mm. But it's also something that I can't help but think is kind of, you know, tinged with patriarchy, you know, these beautiful and dangerous and deadly women who sort of transform into terrible creatures and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts about that and how the shapeshifter is functioning for you within this series and in others. I mean, I think I, I mean, but I think with the, with the series with my dad, I think the, which is, a, which is a bit separate from this, I think with the series with my dad, it's, I think in, in that particular series, there is this kind of, this, this idea of the shapeshifter is this, you know, this kind of reworking and rethinking of your identity. And, and um, I think for that, I, I, was, I was really curious about, like, what, is, what does it mean to claim that identity of American? And, um, and how does that, how does one start to to move into that space of claiming um, that identity, um, and and what what movements or or, or what um, <clears throat> ways in which you you form yourself as an American, um, 
externally, but also internally. And I think with this with this project, I think with Plows of the of the excuse me, Plows of the Peacock, placelessness of of, of echoes. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, it's it's this figure. I think it, it was for me it was more so kind of. Um, thinking through these alternate ways of being, these alternate ideas of, of relationship, and, and, and thinking about agency, and, and thinking about what, what does that mean to become part of, and, and to claim yourself as being part of um, this larger space. Um, and that was, for me, you know, the way in which I was kind of thinking about the, the figure of the shapeshifter. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, I think in, it, it, and it becomes, a, it, I think it becomes a way in which um, a, a liberatory practice in terms of kind of liberating the self, but, um, uh, you know, th this alternate state of, of, of being, mm -hmm. I think becomes important. And she's powerful and kind of at home in this space mm -hmm. as well, which is mm -hmm. kind of like a recuperation potentially of, or a reclaiming of the black female body as shapeshifter potentially. Yeah, I mean, and it's, I think, again, it, you know, it's, it's kind of like the, this kind of the metaphysics of, of what does it mean, the metaphysics of becoming. Mm. Um, <clears throat> And, and that being kind of this kind of constant process that you're kind of navigating. And, and there's, there's something navigational, I think, also about that. Um, and it's not to say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm using it as, as kind of a, an idea to, to work with. Um, not to say, which, which I do get a little um, apprehensive about in terms of not to kind of evoke the idea of magic. Um, and not to say that that's a bad thing. I think, I think magic has its place in terms of kind of thinking about power and power structures. Um, <clears throat> but this, for me, it's, it's really about that, that line, that kind of, that, like that blur, blurring of binaries, really, of kind of what, of, of being one and the other. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Um, so in, in, in some of the images, let's go back, in some of the images, um, you know, there is, I'm kind of going into the landscape and kind of reclothing um, or um, clothing the, the space or clothing um, the wood or the logs um, with fabric. And that was basically kind of used as a, you know, as a tool to kind of think about ways in which that, that shape-shifting is, is occurring or the residuals of that shape-shifting. Um, and also thinking about the echoes of the body, and again, this kind of breaking up, this spatial and temporal breaking um, that happens within um, the night. Um, so a lot of people ask me about the use of the color red in the images. Um, and this was pulled from, you know, when I was doing research for the project, um, I was reading a book, I was use, reading this kind of field guide about how to navigate, you know, outdoors at night. Um, and the author, you know, recommended instead of using a flashlight, um, using a red light instead, um, and that the red light would not disturb the nocturnal creatures, that they don't have necessarily um, the, the sensitivity to red. Um, so that would not be a, a, a color spectrum that they would be alarmed by. Um, so I thought that that would, you know, actually start with this project I've actually started using. Um, a red flashlight at night. And there was a section of the, there was a section of the Palace of the Peacock um, <clears throat> where 
you know, one of the things that really that drew me into the, the uh, book, and the book is really a complicated and complex text that speaks to so many different things, um, but there's a section where he describes the landscape and, and what happens at, and in the landscape, and, and there the, the, he uses the words ancient blocks of shadow. Um, and I wanted to create an image that kind of evoked that idea of, of the landscape being an ancient block of shadow. Um, and also using uh, my own body to kind of evoke the landscape as well. So we have about 10 minutes okay. left. Um, and I know we're very cl close to the end of this, mm -hmm. but it'd be lovely to take some questions if there mm -hmm. are some. Um, but I'd love to um, first interject by asking, because mm -hmm. a number of these images are in the exhibition upstairs. Mm -hmm. And just to talk about the very specific um, uh, installation that you designed, that you mm -hmm. sent us a layout for, which was you know, down to the like, you know, inch of um, distance between images. We have this image and another, which are both portrait orient orient oriented, and then a kind of um, a display of others. And could you talk a little bit about that, or some of the rhythms you were trying to create, or mm -hmm. narrative? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I mean, I wanted to create a space where the images kind of lived in the corner. Um, I, d I mean, ideally, you know, when thinking about the installation for the show here, um, I wanted people to have to have to have to kind of sit or stand um, in a space where the images are on both sides of them, and they're kind of looking into that corner, and just kind of thinking about how the corner can be that that dark space that can be activated. Um, <clears throat> um, in this image, you know. You know, I was again. I was kind of looking for these different um, topographical maps, and and wanting to kind of and again, this, the topographical map is a graphic that allows us to kind of understand where we are within a space. Um, but you know, in in these images, I'm kind of removing visually. I'm removing any. Um, the, I'm removing the legend. Removing any um, you know indicator of of distance, and you know. It became visually became really interesting, and um, I've been working on creating these my own topographical maps using um, fabric, um, <clears throat> and just wanted to kind of and again, it's really kind of creating a, a new sense of understanding of topography and creating my own my own way of kind of navigating and thinking about how I would cre construct a topographical map of my own. Um, um, utilizing um, fabric and also um, I've been stitching and creating these like pod like um, um, sculptures um, that are meant to kind of live in the space as well um, so this is an image from um, what I've been doing in the studio and trying to create um, as many as possible and again, it's just kind of taking that element, um, and part of it is kind of thinking about the residue of the shapeshifter and taking that element out of the images and allowing it to kind of be a space or be within the space itself. Um, <clears throat> and also been working on an installation video. It's meant to be an installation in three parts. Um, we're taking the text and having different uh, people speak to speak or read different pieces of the text and having that be um, kind of overlapped um, within the space um, and also you know one of the other installations I'm thinking through is just being in a dark space where um, it's a log of all of the sounds that I've been recording um, or taking a log of all the sounds I've been recording at night um, along with these video clips. <clears throat> we belong to a short-lived family and people. Damnation! It's so easy to succumb and die. It's the usual thing in this country, as you well know. 
the chicken was smiling, smiling as they came half running, half flying. Our parents died early. They had a hard life. Murderously. Tried to fight their way out of an economic ah! nightmare. Don Farmers and hand to mouth business folk they were. They gave up the ghosts before they had well started to live. He I stared at me significantly eyes. and realized he was a dry look after you, you son. Partly hidden, he gave me in a clump of, of trees. Someone was emerging from the shack and out of the trees. Thank you, Keisha. Thank you. I think we've gone over a little bit. If, well, we can. We'll, we have a reception now, so we can have any questions you want, just without a microphone, and you know, with a glass of wine and some snacks. So, thank you so much for um, being with us. Thank you so much, Keisha. And yeah, um, please do check out the exhibition at your leisure as well. Thank you.